children, we bring you another reading from the tales of Beetle the Bard, read by Yunyel of Gryffindor House. The tales of Beetle the Bard are as well known as Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty to the muggle children around the world. The tales of Beetle the Bard are part of the wonderful world and the wonderful wizarding world of Harry Potter. And without further ado, the great reader of the stories, Yaniel of Gryffindor House. Hello, children! Welcome back for another tale. This is the uh, next one in the series, The Fountain of Fair Fortune. If you like this one, make sure to look for the ones I've done before. Now, this is the last one I'll be doing in a little while. But worry not. Come Hallow's Eve you will see another. Now, let us settle down and get ready for a story. Ah, <sighs> just one moment. Mm. Now, again, where is that book? Ah, no matter. Ready? Akio! Finally, that you must learn to stay where you're put. Without further ado, I bring to you all the Fountain of Fair Fortune. High on a hill in an enchanted garden, enclosed by tall walls protected by strong magic, flowed the Fountain of Fair Fortune. Once a year, between the hours of sunrise and sunset on the longest day, a single unfortunate was given the chance to fight their way to the fountain, bathe in its waters, and receive fair fortune forevermore. On that appointed day, hundreds of people traveled from all over the kingdom to reach the garden walls before dawn. Male, female, rich, poor, young and old, of magical means and without, they gathered in the darkness, each one hoping that they would be the one to gain entrance into the special garden. Three witches, each with her burden of woe, met on the outskirts of the crowd and told one another their sorrows as they waited for sunrise. The first, by name of Asha, was sick of a malady that no healer could cure. She hoped that the fountain would banish her symptoms and grant her a long and happy life. Now the second, by the name Athilda, had been robbed of her home, her gold, and her wand. By an evil sorcerer, she hoped that the fountain might relieve her of powerlessness and poverty. The third, by name Amata, had been deserted by the man whom she loved dearly, and she thought her heart would never mend. She hoped that the fountain would relieve her of her grief and her longing. Pitying each other, the three women agreed that if chance should befall them, they would unite and try to reach the fountain together. The sky was rent with the first ray of sun, and a chink in the wall opened. The crowd surged forward, each of them shrieking their claim for the fountain's benishing. Creepers from the garden beyond snaked through the passing mass and twisted themselves around the first witch, Asha. She grasped the wrist of the second witch, Athilda, who seized tight upon the robes of the third witch, Amata and Amata became caught upon the armor of a dismal-looking knight who was seated on a bone-thin horse. The creepers tugged the three witches through the chink in the wall, and the knight was dragged off his steed after them. The furious screams of the disappointed throng rose upon the morning air, then fell silent as the garden walls sealed once more. 
Asha and Athilda were angry with Amata, who had accidentally brought along the night. Only one can bathe in the fountain. It will be hard enough to decide which it will be without adding another. Now, Sir Luckless, as the knight was known in the land outside the walls, observed that these were witches, and having no magic, nor any great skill at jousting or dueling with swords, nor anything that distinguished the non-magical man, was sure that he had no hope of beating the three women to the fountain. He therefore declared his intention of withdrawing outside the walls again. At this, Amata became angry too. Faint heart, she chided him, draw your sword, knight, and help us reach our goal. And so the three witches and the forlorn, forlorn knight ventured forth into the enchanted garden, where rare herbs, fruit, and fr flowers grew in abundance on either side of the sunlit paths. They met no obstacle until they reached the foot of the hill upon which the fountain stood. There, however, wrapped around the base of the hill was a monstrous white worm, bloated and blind. At their approach, it turned a foul face upon them and uttered the following words, Pay me proof of your pain. Sir Luckless drew his sword and attempted to kill the beast, but his blade snapped. Then Athilda cast rocks at the worm, while Asha and Amata essayed every spell that might subdue or entrance it, but their power of their wands was no more effective than their friend's stones or the knight's steed. The worm would not let them pass. The sun rose higher and higher into the sky, and Asha, despairing, began to weep. Then the great worm placed its face upon hers and drank the tears from her cheeks. Its thirst assaged, the worm slithered aside and vanished into a hole in the ground. Rejoicing at the worm's disappearance, the three witches and night began to climb the hill, sure that they would reach the fountain before noon. Halfway up the steep slope, however, they came across words cut into the ground before them. Pay me the fruit of your labors. Sir Luckless took out his only coin and placed it upon the grassy hillside, but it rolled away and was lost. The three witches and the knight continued to climb, but though they walked for hours more, they advanced not one step. The summit came no near, and still the inscription lay in the earth before them. All were discouraged as the sun rose over their heads and begun to sink toward the far horizon, but Ithilda walked faster and harder than any of them and exhorted the others to follow her example, though she moved no further up the enchanted hill. Courage, friends, do not yield, she cried, wiping the sweat from her brow, and as the drops fell glittering into the earth, the inscription blocking their path vanished, and they found that they were able to move upward once more. Delighted by the removal of the second obstacle, they hurried toward the summon as fast as they could, until at last they glimpsed the fountain, glittering like crystal in a bower of flowers and trees. Before they could reach it, however, they came to a stream that ran around the hilltop, barring their way. In the depth of the clear water lay a smooth stone bearing these words. Pay me the treasure of your past. Sir Luckless attempted to float across the stream in his shield, but it sank. The three witches pulled him from the water, then tried to leap the brook themselves, but it would not let them cross, and all the while the sun was shrinking lower into the sky. So they fell, pondering the meaning of the stone's message, and Amata was the first to understand. Taking her, wa her ma wand, she drew from her mind all the memories of happy times she had spent with her vanished lover, then dropped them into the rushing waters. The stream swept them away, and stepping stones appeared, and the three witches and the knight were able to pass at last onto the summit of the hill.
The fountain shimmered before them, set amidst herbs and flowers rarer and more beautiful than any had ever seen. The sky burned ruby, and it was time to decide which one of them would bathe. Before they could make their decision, however, frail Asha fell to the ground. Exhausted by the struggle to the summit, she was close to death. Her three friends would have carried her to the fountain, but Asha was in mortal agony and begged them not to touch her. Then Ithilda hastened to pick up those herbs she thought most useful and mixed them in Sir Luckless' gourd of water and poured the potion into Asha's mouth. At once, Asha was able to stand. What was more, all symptoms of her dread malady vanished. I am cured, she cried. I have no need of the fountain. Let Athilda bathe. But Athilda was busy collecting more herbs in her apron. If I can cure this disease, I shall earn gold aplenty. Let Amata bathe. Sir Luckless bowed and gestured Amata toward the fountain. But she shook her head. The stream had washed away all regret for her lover, and she saw now that she had been cruel and faithless, and it was happiness enough to be rid of him. Good sir, you must bathe as a reward for all your chivalry, she told Sir Luckless. So the knight clanked forth in the last rays of the setting sun and bathed in the fountain of fair fortune, astonished that he was chosen out of hundreds and giddy with his incredible luck. As the sun fell below the horizon, Sir Luckless emerged from the waters with the glory of his triumph upon him and flung himself in the rusted armor at the feet of Amata, who was the kindest and most beautiful woman he had ever beheld. Flushed with success, he begged for her hand and her heart, and Amata, no less delighted, realized that she had found a man worthy of them. The three witches and the knights set off down the hill, together, arm in arm, all four led long and happy lives, and none of them ever knew or suspected that the fountain's waters carried no enchantment at all. <sighs> Excellent story, my dears. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, please, be sure to uh, check our other postings, like and share, um, and stay tuned for the final reading, which you may find only in Halloween. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.